Hi there, my name is Dr. Marcus Bussey and I'm going to introduce you to my course History 140, Global Citizens, A History of Humanity. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been teaching this course now for a few years and with every uh, year it's always something new to explore for me. It makes it exciting it, and, and rich and deep. Now that newness, excitement and depth comes from the fact that it's basically a history of everything, uh, which might sound uh, daunting or confusing, but really it's a lot of fun. It's fun because all the interests that we bring to uh, our passion of, of history itself uh, have scope to be explored and understood and sometimes uh, rethought through the process of world history. For me, as a historian and a futurist, uh, I find that dealing with whatever context I may be in, whether I'm writing an academic paper, giving a talk, working with grassroots uh, groups on social action and social change, wherever I am, whatever part of the world I'm in, uh, world history informs my thinking and deepens my discussion and enables me to frame things and that's an important thing to frame things in ways that empower as opposed to disempower. So this is an active hands-on uh, engagement with historical thinking. So let me give you an overview of the course. Essentially this course examines humanity in the context of the world we live in. We do this by exploring three themes, energy, complexity and collective learning. These themes are drawn from the work of world historian David Christian. He's a, an academic based in Macquarie University, New South Wales. Uh, his ideas and thinking have recently been picked up by Bill Gates, who's very enthusiastic about it and throwing lots of money to get world history into uh, secondary schools uh, around the US. And also there are a few in Australia picking up uh, world history as well and working closely with David Christian on that. Now, the ideas in world history are detailed in uh, Christian's uh, reading that is our first reading for week one, our world history in context. I also summarise the course approach in the introduction that accompanies the course Blackboard site. So when you uh, log into Blackboard and you open up History 140, you'll see at the top left hand corner, introduction. Uh, click on that and you will get some further uh, insights into energy, complexity and collective learning. Now let's ask ourselves, and it's a serious question, well, why study world history? We study world history to make sense of human social evolution and therefore to better understand what is happening to us now. Currently humankind is facing a series of choices, some would call them challenges, and some would call them crises, relating to firstly the environment, then demography, that's the uh, human population and human population movements, and the question of social justice and inclusivity. So these choices uh, challenge us, call us, demand of us, however you want to frame it, to rethink our relationship to environment, demography and social justice and inclusivity. This is all, I would argue, social learning. It's how do we learn as collectives, as societies, to keep on evolving into more socially just, more inclusive, more environmentally aware uh, and more sensitive, that means uh, socially sensitive human beings. To make sound choices, we need the right kind of information, one, and thinking. Most history, that as, and I'm sure that you've come into this course thinking this, is a tale of progress in which the past is more primitive than the present and the future will suppose uh, a shiny version of the present. You know, it, it's projecting what we have today, following the progress story, um, so that tomorrow we can only assume uh, will probably be a qualified better given that we've been constantly told now that the future might also see the total uh, collapse of our society. So this kind of history, conventional history, focuses on big and exciting history like empires, the story of great men, 
and occasionally women, and also in other notable events like revolutions and uh, so on. World history looks at how we as a social species have come to be modern. How did we get to be where we are? It's a key question and it's an important question because it informs how we think about how we can become better than we are today, how we can keep this tale of improvement, the progress story going, but we're going to have to rewrite major sections of that story. Now there are two assumptions here. The first is that world history, any history, has a context. Now this context is the network of relationships that underpin this universe and both human and non-human activity in it. There are two kinds of relationship. Essentially one's biophysical, involves the cosmos, planet Earth and all the other planets, biosphere and uh, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, all these various spheres and, and so on. That provide the context in which human societies have evolved. The second one, of course, is the social. It's about social relationships, uh, how technology, economics, culture affect and, con and will continue to affect and evolve and frame our thinking and shape our responses and our capacity to respond. The second assumption in, in world history is that humans are a social species who learn collectively. Collective learning is at the heart of human culture. World history tells the story of local and global cultures over time. World historians are very interested in how we learn or indeed fail to learn and what happens then. So this boils down to how we learn to manage our resources and to handle the increased complexity that arises as we get better at extracting energy from the environment. So we've already brought in two things here, energy and complexity, and of course the whole framework there is how do we learn, how do we collective learn. Now these are the three key ingredients of uh, our approach in this course. So world history, with it we take a big picture view. We look at the entire story of the human cosmos from the Big Bang to now. Now I say human cosmos because the cosmos uh, as we understand it is human because we observe it. Our relationship with the cosmos makes the cosmos in a sense human because it becomes part of us, part of our culture, part of our uh, knowledge systems and of course part of our thinking about energy and meaning and what does it mean to be human in this universe, in this cosmos. And we start from the Big Bang don't spend a lot of time there, but it was pretty noisy, and we come through to now. So we acknowledge that all these stories are provisional. In other words, they're interpretations. They could be, and Christian calls them this, creation stories. Now, if you go to his book, uh, Maps of Time, which is in the library, great book, read the introduction or photocopy and keep the introduction. It's well worth having uh, because in that introduction, he outlines the fact that his reliance on uh, evolution, drawing on cosmology, uh, is still provisional. He doesn't say this is the story. He said this is the best story we have at the moment to do the kind of work we're doing in this kind of world history. So we work in world history between global contexts and local contexts. Local history is a subset of world history. World history organises our understanding of local history while in turn we use local history, i.e. specific historical events and contexts, to test our thinking in world history. So let me give you an example now. Let's look at the transition from an agricultural to an industrial society. World historically we can say that this transition has occurred at different times around the globe and that the shift began in the English Midlands around the 1750s with the coming of the steam engine and the factory. We can also assert that this shift is still going on as the developing world plays catch up. There's no one stable temporal unit. There are multiple temporal units. That in itself is something to get our head around. 
So we can also assert that some parts of the world are now entering a post-industrial phase. So whilst the majority of the world are living now in urban industrial environments, there's still a vast number of people living agriculturally and there is an increasing number of people who are becoming what one would have to say a post-industrial people. We're not sure what that means, it's a very interesting question and it's certainly one that at the end of this course and, and if you were to take HIS 232 which looks at world history in the 20th century context and beyond uh, into the future, you know, it, we can keep discussing this and we'll keep exploring. And it's based on relationship to energy, how we manage and respond to complexity and how we learn in doing all of that. So some of the ingredients involved in this shift then, now here's back to specific history. Involves the invention of the steam engine, changes in agriculture, invention or creation of private property, the creation of new global financial institutions, the creation of an urban workforce, and the creation of a global market. Now all of these things will be discussed in greater depth in lectures in this course. So of course not all of this, I mean this list is not all but it's enough to have a look at energy, complexity and collective learning. So that's the world historical analysis. We can look at them through those lenses beginning with energy. All of these developments involve a change in our relationship with energy. As we move from agriculture to industrial, major shifts in our relationship to the energy sources available to us in the environment occurred. Essentially industrialism leverages much greater amounts of energy from the environment than agriculture societies ever did. Now let's look at it this way. All living organisms take energy from the environment. Hominids, going right back to Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalus, we develop tools. We know that also that other primates have tools and that even non-primates have and use tools and that these enable them to increase the energy yield from the environment. The Industrial Revolution, very much a tool-based revolution, involves new relationship with our world. Okay, the world has now become a resource it's not something we're part of or embedded in as in the agricultural sense, but the world is something we look to to find the things we need. So our relationship is very much contractual. I want this so I will take it. Uh, we might give certain things back. Let's say we might grow um, industrial forests instead of just going out and chopping down forests uh, to make paper or for timber or whatever. But it's very much now that the environment natural and social environment have both become resources because we human beings are also are now part of the resource of an industrial system. And I'll explain that a little bit very shortly. So what can we say? The steam engine leveraged energy from the environment and enabled people to increasingly create a surplus. A surplus is stored energy. Of course that a surplus is, is at the very heart of capitalist thinking and our uh, commitment to capitalist economics. New agricultural practices based on increasing effective use or application of scientific method similarly increased the energy yields, act at the productivity of the land. And that was really important because as we threw people off the land to create urban populations we needed to be able to get more out of the land to feed those populations and we needed to do it with less people and, and also to increase its productivity. Private ownership, very important of course, of land increased. Okay, and it changed the, the relationship with land because now it became land that we managed for profit, not subsistence as in the, in the agricultural context. So to effectively distribute and harness global capital, remember energy equals capital, new financial, legal and political systems were also developed from in this period. Human energy that was previously used in subsistence farming was abolished. Okay. As the Enclosure Act swept subsistence farmers and traditional village life, rural life from the English countryside and concentrated large unhappy populations in urban centres. 
to effectively increase the energy footprint both by our access to resources that's things that we need like cotton or coal or sugar or tobacco and the distribution of goods now we, we make the cotton into goods we get the cotton from India we send the material the cloth back to India okay that's what Gandhi twigged on to you know we needed global markets to evolve global markets were premised on at, in the early stages on globalizing empires like the British Empire for instance so moving on so all this we know it's well documented in traditional history. Okay, books like uh, David Landers' *The Unbound Prometheus* it's in the library. All the texts that I cite are in the library. You now look at this relationship between uh, the tools and the society that we created, and we now think of as an industrial society. What's significant for us in world history? is that we focus on the relationships between societies and their energy regimes. Between the societies and their energy regimes. How do we do business? What's our relationship with nature, the planet? And uh, that of course leads to this beautiful uh, discipline called environmental history or uh, green history, it's sometimes called as well. Now every civilization is dependent on massive extraction of energy. This is, we can understand this. You can go back to the ancient Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Maya, the Indus Valley civilization, ancient Rome. These were civilizations that learnt to manage the agricultural resources in such a way to concentrate huge surpluses in centers. And those centers were the heartland of uh, the civilization. Should that energy source, however, collapse, then civilization ends. Now, all those uh, civilizations that I cited, with the exception of Egypt, suffered energy source collapse. Egypt ultimately uh, evolved through various layers of invasion into a, an, a, a, into a, an Islamic society but uh, it still retained its essential dependence on the Nile and its abundance. The same can also be said of uh, China's civilization, which is the longest continuous civilization on the, on the planet. And it goes back to three and a half, uh, three and a half, four thousand years at least. And it's all based on the richness, the agricultural richness of the heartland of the, uh, of the Qin dynasties. Okay, so let's look then at what happens when we get hands-on energy. Well, things become more complex. Basically, once we've mapped energy in this sense, in looking at the transition from agriculture to industry, we can look at complexity. Increased energy directly correlates with increased social complexity. That means increased technological complexity, economic complexity, cultural complexity, and so on. David Christian makes this point very clearly in his article, which is our week one reading, where he says, what seems to happen is that when large energy flows are available, they can sometimes bind independent entities into new and more complex structures. So in other words, things that were previously unrelated or discrete aspects of an in context or an environment suddenly become closely bound together through a, a, an energy increase. And that's uh, what we call complexity. Essentially, this owes uh, its fundamental premise to systems thinking, where we understand that uh, systems never exist in a vacuum, that systems are nested within systems, um, and they are layered uh, in, in various ways. So chaos theory, complexity theory uh, have all fed into informing this kind of thought. So the modern world is characterized by complex social, technological, financial and environmental conditions. We know this. Uh, you, you can, any, any news headline will be telling you this kind of thing. Complex, though, is not the same as complicated. And often the news and the media make things complicated without actually acknowledging complexity. Complexity involves multiple interactions that happen simultaneously and often quite unexpectedly in a range of overlapping or nested systems. Now, complicated is different. Now, if I sat you down and gave you a manual for the Mercedes-Benz engine and I had all the parts of the engine in front of you and I said, assemble that, that's complicated. But it's not complex. 
it's quite different. Complicated can be very daunting, uh, but it's not the same as complex. Complex requires a different kind of thinking to complicatedness, where we have to learn how to put an engine together, for instance. This is more like thinking, well, what about the energy involved in the engine? What about the histories of the engine? What about how metals were forged? What about the story of oil? And so on. That's when we, things get complex because various energy systems and regimes, various moments in history and culture, uh, technological, social evolution have occurred to make those parts uh, of, the, of the engine available to us. World history demonstrates that complex systems are less stable than simple systems. Christian spends quite a bit of time drawing the work of Eric Chasson in, in the uh, article for week one, looking at the energy system or relationship of a star and comparing it to the uh, energy relation system of a, a single-celled organism and points out that single-celled organisms are one, much more complex, but two, uh, they last uh, infinitely short time compared to a star which will last billions of years. Okay, so complex systems are less stable and that's another important insight for this course. So in the transition from agricultural society to industrial society we can see that instability has in fact become a defining feature of social consciousness. So to look at the history of the transition in England and Europe we can see instability both as a permanent insecurity in people, people are insecure, permanently anxious and also in revolution. The steam engine, for instance, created modern textile industry okay, and it destroyed small time weavers and their livelihoods. And understandably, they were upset, so they riot in 18, 11 and 12 and we know these riots now as the Luddite riots. And you can tell who won because Luddites, uh, or the term Luddite, is, is always used in a pejorative sense of putting people down. You don't say uh, glowingly, oh, I'm a Luddite. Though I've had students now tell me that they they'd like to be Luddites, but I've still noticed they have uh, mobile phones and so on. So I'm, I think it's more an aspirational thing. But essentially, the, to be a Luddite, up until perhaps a, a post-industrial sort of horizon line appearing, has always been a pejorative term. So another area of uh, considerable instability we see arising around the Enclosure Acts, which destroyed local economies of entire communities, caused massive suffering, which spilled over, not directly always, not A leads to B to C, that's cause and effect, but in various revolutions it was one of the things that fueled popular dissatisfaction. And that's from the American Revolution in 1776 all the way through to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. So instability and revolution are part of the landscape and of course if you take that word revolution we can also say well we've had a, a political revolutions which are the ones I'm just referring to there but we've had a scientific revolution which led to the scientific method that informed an agricultural revolution which changed the way uh, societies extracted energy to feed populations. We've had the industrial revolution. These are all terms that talk that use the word revolution to in, uh, indicate an overthrowing of an older form and the uh, emergence of a new form. So in all this we have to say what did we learn? That's a collective learning question. Well one answer is that we learnt how to be modern. We were taught over time how to be modern through this experience as a society and as individuals. Not to be modern is to be extremely uncool. Now, what did this mean? Well, 100, 150 years ago, as our nation states embraced being modern, they did the following. They taught us to be literate. We had to become literate. We had to become citizens. Modern nation states require citizens. Quite a different concept to pre-modern states, in which people were serfs, uh, or they were part of a, a, an elite, one elite or another. But citizenship was, uh, didn't exist in the time of Henry VIII or in the time of Louis XIV of France. That's a pre-modern concept uh, to, to be a... Uh, you were never French, for instance, except maybe Louis XIV who said he was France himself, but you uh, came from Provence or you came from... Uh, 
Brittany or wherever it was. Okay. Now, we also had to become disciplined. Those three things, literacy, citizenship and discipline, were all uh, central planks in, in, the re in the emergence of the modern education system. We had to learn how to do things that had no meaning that were dull and boring. That's what education is all about. Citizenship taught us, the schools taught us to have allegiance to an abstraction, Australia. France, Germany, wherever it was, and to be effective in a modern industrial world, we had to be literate. We had to be able to read and write. We also had to consume. And consumption is uh, very, very important, and it's a new way of being, because in pre-modern world, we subsisted. We didn't consume in the same way. So we need to rethink these things. We need to think, re rethink literacy citizenship, discipline and consumption. We need to move literacy away from the ABCs and talk about social and environmental ecological sustainability literacies and cosmopolitan literacies. Citizenship needs to move from local nation, nation state citizenship to global citizenship, hence the title of this course. What does it mean to be a planetary citizen? What kind of allegiances do we have? What kind of sensitivities and sensibilities do we need to foster and develop? What does it mean to be disciplined? Perhaps it means to uh, behave in different ways. We've been disciplined consumers. Can we be disciplinedly um, sustainable? Sustainability takes discipline. Can we uh, be disciplined in our relationship with others where we don't strike out in fear? at the other, but we actually include them. Social justice issues often uh, can be uh, rethought, not often, they can always be rethought in terms of discipline. But it's a very different kind of discipline, it's an inner discipline built around uh, an accept, uh, the acceptance of a whole different set of premises for how we are going to manage the world around us. And of course, how do we consume? It's not that consumption goes out, human beings have always had to eat have had to have shelter and health care and all the rest of it. That's not the issue. But consumption that's premised on growth and competition is a, quite a, a toxic uh, mix and is, of course, now starting to show up um, in the weaknesses of the modern industrial state and the panic around climate change and sustainability and so on. So we can see in this example the example of transition from agriculture to industrial, uh, that societies are energy dependent and that how they extract energy determines how we define them, agricultural societies and industrial societies. The more energy a society can access increases the level of social complexity. Social complexity is managed and meaning is created by collective learning in which humans adapt culturally to new situations. In cultural adaptation, happens far faster than biologic, biological adaptation. So in this course, we rethink much of the dominant uh, assumptions that we have about the world and about history, about our relationship to the environment and so on. So the rethinking regarding literacy, regarding uh, citizenship, regarding uh, discipline and consumption, all uh, fall under the banner of what we're trying to do here in world history. So in, in, in this kind of history is about looking back and looking forward to get a handle on the present and what it means today to be a global citizen. So I hope that this brief introduction will help you navigate both this course and the week one reading, World History in Context. I will produce another uh, little webinar uh, for you to uh, access to help you navigate that piece. It's a, a great read. It's rich and deep and therefore that's code for it can be challenging. Read it in small chunks, read and reread. Allow yourself time with that piece. It's, uh, as I say, it's a great piece and I'm going to share with you uh, some of my favourite bits out of that in the next uh, one of these webinars that I put up. I'm, I'm actually not appearing as webinars, are they? But they uh, essentially I'm using webinar technology to produce them. Thank you very much. I really look forward to meeting you all. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. And uh, yep, we'll catch up in week one.
Thanks. Bye.